Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Hey, everyone. I am here with Tommy Wood and Chris Masterjohn. Both of them have PhDs. Tommy has an MD as well. Chris has been studying nutrition since many people who are listening to this podcast were born. And <laughs> both of them really know a lot about health and nutrition. And, you know, and, and they really also dug into testing, which is, the, which is what I want to talk about in this podcast. And when I interviewed both of them, they both seem to have different leanings on what you would call alternative or functional medicine testing. And that would include things like these Genova diagnostic tests or these Dutch tests, these organic acid tests, and a variety of these tests that are not tested in conventional medicine, but they're tested in functional medicine. And these tests are very expensive. And I personally want to know myself what if I should be taking them or what the what kind of value I could be getting. When I spoke to Tommy individually, he was he seemed to be saying that maybe some of them, a, a very few of them were legit, but most of them were not. And it seemed like Chris was saying that more than a few of them were legit and, and then some of them were not, right? So it was like maybe like half of them are legit and, and, and a minority are not. So I, I wanted to try to get a, a deeper understanding of what are the, which one of these tests are legitimate and which ones aren't. So let, let's first start off with what are the most important tests in this functional medicine testing, just so we get the broad understanding of the field. Chris, what maybe, do you maybe mean? You, could... do you mean like what are the most popular ones or? Yeah, like let's there's so we know there's oh. the Dutch there's the Dutch test. OK, like I, I just want to get a broad understanding of what the outline well, I, we're going to let, let me let discuss. me phrase it let me phrase it this way so i you know i come at this from the perspective of not trying to understand whether the great plains organic acids test is good or bad or the genova ion panel is good or bad i i came from it from the perspective of if i was to try to find something what what is the most efficient way to get as many as possible of all the well-validated markers of nutritional status in one go. And I compiled a years ago, I took all the major panels that had any significant number of those markers but with the markers. Well, first of all, I selected all the markers based on when possible validation against clinical signs and symptoms of deficiency in experimental depletion repletion studies. When not possible, I selected just sort of presumable proxies for that in depletion repletion studies. When not possible, I went to case reports of deficiency. And when not possible, I went to what made the most sense, but had some kind of validation somewhere. And so I put all those together in a spreadsheet. And then I looked at, you know, what panels have many of these things. And then I put all those together and I said, okay, which panel has the most of these things? And it turns out that the Genova Ion plus 40 amino acids is the panel that has the most. And that is primarily a combination of plasma amino acids and urinary organic acids. But they also throw in a bunch of other random stuff that includes additional markers of nutritional status. And just, you know, in broad strokes, I believe that nearly everything that I've ever heard anyone say about markers of nutritional status is deeply profoundly misunder misleading from every everyone except from except from the textbook modern nutrition and health and disease or from the DRI reports produced by the National Academy of Medicine formerly the Institute of Medicine or or by meta analyses of of nutritional biomarkers in peer reviewed journals outside of those sources everything i've ever heard anyone say is is deeply wrong and and based on complete misunderstanding such as you know statements like you need to look at it in the tissues instead of the blood which makes no sense from an from an anatomy perspective because blood is a tissue but much more importantly than that makes you know you need to look at functional markers instead of plasma concentration all these things are are false 
because you have to look at it at a case by case basis. And if there's experimental depletion repletion studies where they induced deficiency in people and then took them out of the deficiency and looked at the markers, then you know what works and what doesn't. And, and sometimes that's a urinary organic acid related to the metabolic pathway of the nutrient. Sometimes it's a blood concentration. Sometimes it's an enzyme, enzyme activity in a, in a blood cell that you measured it before and after you in vitro added a vitamin to it. It depends on the vitamin in terms of what's the best marker of nutritional status. And unfortunately, there's no panel that has all of them. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, right now with the metabolic experiments I'm doing on myself, I'm running like three of these different panels because, you know, two or three markers on each one is useful. And then, by the way, that includes the deeply non-transparent algorithm that all of these companies use to give that BS thing at the beginning that says like, you need more of this and less of this, which is the only part that anyone reads except someone who has expertise in the relevant biochemistry. And that's the only part that I skip. So anyway. Okay, so I think we already have some common understanding here. The beginning part where they have their algorithm and, and some content and recommendations is nonsense. I think we can, th there's a broad consensus here. It's a waste of, of PDF digital space. <laughs> it's a waste of bits. I got it. <laughs> okay. Now, so I, I guess we can focus on, Tommy, there's the Dutch urine test, right? And there's the organic acids test. And then there's the Genova ion panel. Is there any in your experience that were quite broadly used? So, so I mean, there are there are a bunch of other things. We mentioned some, some of them last time. Right. And so... We meant we talked about, and I would like to zoom out for a second first to like give you how I think about it. But we talk about the Dutch test just because it's the one that's most well known for for urine hormones. But there are several other companies that do dried urine hormone analysis. So I, so we're not singling out Dutch. And actually, as companies go, Dutch is you know they know how to run a mass spec. They've shown that you know their tests are accurate compared to to other methods. And most companies have not done that. But, you know, you could do other things like, I'd like to talk about four-point cortisol rhythm during the day, which a bunch of companies do. This in That's a very common urine. one. That's a yeah, very common cortisol one. Cortisol rhythm. Uh, that's a very common one. Last time we talked about IgG food intolerance tests. That's, that's another common one. Increasingly that's a common, common one. You do it with a food prick, finger prick at home. But to kind of zoom out, the way I've, I've, I think about this is, for each individual marker, and this is certainly how, how Chris approaches it, I know, is the test valid? Is the test accurate and repeatable? And for some of these tests, I've had issues with repeatability, which we can certainly talk about, and that's going to differ from company to company and how well they run their tests. Then you also need to know, like, what are the analytic and biologic, biologic variability? I think that's, that's important. And then you need to know what's the best case scenario for using this test. And the best case scenario for, say, multiple urine organic acids tests of B vitamin status are you've done them after a, an amino acid challenge, right? Formula glutamate after a histidine challenge, right? But you probably can't do that. But so it un, it's unchallenged, right? That's probably the best case based on most tests. And it's in the context of a good history and lots of other tests, and you're paying Chris Master John for his time to, in, to interpret them for you. That is the best case scenario. The what's the but <laughs> okay. what's the typical the, what's the typical scenario? The typical scenario is some practitioners orders these tests. They don't understand the biochemistry, and they're reading the high line which says this person needs more of this because of some crappy algorithm developed by the company that doesn't even understand the tests. Right? That's the typical case, and so. I think all of those are important. And one of the reasons why I'm often against these tests is because the typical case is potentially harming the, the, the client or the patient. So based on what you're saying, Tommy, you're saying that there's a best case scenario about how people are going to be using these tests. And in reality, 99% of the people are not using them in, the, in, a, in a reasonable way right? Because they're looking at these, they're just looking at the bottom line of, of what the recommendations are. Chris mentioned that he agreed with that, that the, the, the beginning is he doesn't buy into that. But let's get into maybe some specifics on these tests about, you know, if somebody is using them in a best case scenario, right? Which of them could be useful? And, you know, maybe we'll start with like, uh, which ones do you know the best, Tommy? 
So the the ones that I'm most familiar with are probably maybe potentially different from Chris's. So like Chris's nutritional markers, I would absolutely go go to him. Things that I've looked at specifically are related to urinary hormones, urinary cortisol. soul. We talked about IgG tests, those kinds of things. So so maybe we can cover different tests and then you know, come together. Okay. So you're like the you you were basically ordering either a Dutch test or a competitor of a Dutch test for these urinary hormones. So so I will so just just one point because I it came, I I I listened to you guys talk, talking about this and wh- one point that came up and it, it's an issue that I've had with some of these tests is repeatability. So for some, there's one particular company I don't want to. Really don't want to name names, but like, there's one company where I, I did at least a couple of times a split sample on a urine organic acids test, and I just sent them separately under two different names. It's the same sample, but and saw very different results. And and part of this, what I, was that true for? Was was that true for uh, across analytes, or were, were it specific analytes that were highly variable? Yeah, that's a good question. I if I remember correctly, it was. Um, the the dopamine pathway metabolites that 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 really jumped out as being very different, and I don't know, and it could be it could be anywhere. It could, I don't know if it's stability, if like they showed up on different days. I don't know if it's like does this like some some functional test companies absolutely know how to run a mass spec. They know the problems with drift across a run. They know the problems with changing columns. Right, they they know how to set things up properly, but some are just like some dude in an industrial park somewhere with a mass spec and a few pipettes, and we just don't know how good the analytical process is. That's that's one of my concerns. But I think Chris has I, I really wish I really wish that there there were some there was some kind of standard expectation that we could rely on that when we get our results, somehow the the like coefficient of variation of each mm-hmm. analyte for each batch is accessible. So, you know, you obviously know most people that get results don't know anything about that, including the people ordering the tests. But for those that do, I, I wish there was a paper trail where you could, you know, click, you know, a few clicks away, you get, well, this was in this batch. We had four standard controls that had a CB of X percent for each analyte because, you know, they must be doing that in the lab. And if they're not doing that in the lab, they really don't know what the hell they're yeah. doing. And so it's got to be there, yeah. but but there's no transparency, and that's true across all labs. I, you can't you can't find that out for your lab core tests either. Tommy's talk. Well, if you take if you take the same sample and you divide it in two and you send it in, you're talking about the re- reproducibility within a batch or across batches of measuring the analyte, which mm-hmm. is which is one thing. There's going to be variation in both of those, and in fact, you know, I think people think these are these are they see numbers and they think math. And math is exact, <laughs> but these numbers are not math. These are like, you used math in making this number, but it's still, it's, it's still, so just to, just to share an experience, when I was in grad school in our lab, my, my, my lab mate from China, who, who, who said that she's an atheist because she was a member of the communist party and they don't allow you to have any other religion. She put up a sign that, that had a prayer to the HPLC gods because it was just, a running joke in the lab that that like yes we're scientists but there's like witchcraft going on in here and we don't know why like (laughs) it's just going up this way and that way and so what what you do is is you run you run you have what we would do is we would everyone in the lab would pool our plasma together and mix it together as a huge batch of control plasma and then we would run four or five of four to six or whatever of those in every single batch and calculate you take the you take the standard deviation of the control samples. You divide it by the mean of the analyte. That gives you the coefficient of variation, which so like under five percent is pretty good. Eight percent is good for a difficult assay, but it's pretty bad for a good. And you know if it's twenty three percent or something, you're like, we have a problem. And then you also take we have that in the freezer, and then you run that across batches because you know that you have batch to batch variation, and you have no idea where it comes from. But you just adjust it, right? So if the mean, like if you ran 30 batches and the mean of your control plasma is whatever, then you just adjust all of the batches for one study to that. 
And there's other ways to do that too. You can get, you can order from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. You can get NIST standards and do the same thing with it, et cetera. But there's, there's a degree of, it's, there's, a, there's as much art as there is science in coming up with these numbers, but it, all diagnosis is a medical model used for decision-making that there's a saying in statistics, all models are false, but some are useful. That also applies to diagnosis. A diagnosis is a reality distortion filter that allows you to select what's in, what is important that you're looking at to triage decisions to treat or not treat with whatever and then judge your success on it. But you are taking continuous variables of biochemistry that don't care about your diagnosis and you are turning them into the diagnosis. So it's also important to say you, there's another way of looking at this, which is maybe you don't have a diagnosable condition, but you feel a little off because your biochemistry is a little off and you can't calculate the sensitivity and specificity for being a little off because there's too many things that could be a little off and none of them fit into a diagnostic model. So there's that as that's well. That's also true. That That's definitely true. I, I agree with that as well. Right. That's, it's, I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree with everything Chris said, but to, to like, to bring it back to the variability point that I was kind of trying to make. So some of it is, you know, is in some labs, there may be a potential issue with what something's happening such that the results are just wildly different from the same sample. And I know people have had the same issue with some of the stool tests that are out there. We didn't talk about stool tests. That's, that's something else that's very common. Oh, right. So that, that's that's an issue. Beast. Yeah. But then there's also, even in the setting, and this is kind of what Chris alluded to, even in the setting of good analytical techniques, there is some analytic variability and then there is some biological variability as well. So I have an example with total testosterone, right? Most labs will say that their analytic variability is four to five percent, which is good. And then if you look at biologic variability across various studies, it's somewhere between eight and twelve percent from the same person, just based on time of day and various other things. If I measure my total testosterone and it's six hundred nanograms per deciliter, and then I remeasure it and it's seven hundred and fifty, that difference could be just due to biologic variability. Nothing else could have changed, despite a hundred and fifty point increase, a twenty five percent increase, right? And that's just due, due to variability from day to day in me, as, and that's normal, and day to day variability in the test. And I don't think most people appreciate that, right? They don't appreciate these aspects that go into the number that you then see on, you know, on a test. And this is like the, the, this is the case for blood tests, just as it is for every other test. Yeah, okay. and for cholesterol, for total cholesterol, there were for all the conventional lipid markers way decades ago. There was, I think, Ansel Keys was involved. They did track people for a year and measured their blood lipids quarterly on a standardized diet. And the standard deviation for total cholesterols was something like 17 point something milligrams per deciliter, which means that if you want to know whether it's increased or decreased, you have to look at something that's basically larger than 34 milligrams per deciliter of a change yeah. to even know that it's outside the bounds of what you would expect on a defined diet over time. Oh, I, I wanted to say in the stool, you, the stool might have more variability just because it's not homogenous. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true, depending on where, where you take the sample. But I, when people have done this, I believe they've done some good stirring to make sure that it was at least equally distributed because you obviously have different bugs on the outside rather than the inside. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you want to hear about the one health hack that is sure to change your life? Okay, here it is. Subscribing to this podcast. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. Click the subscribe button now and enjoy the rest of the episode. Okay, so let's go with these. Let's start with the urinary hormone test. Tommy, do you, what kind of value or... What do you think is valuable there or not valuable? I, th I think last time I was on your show, I mentioned that urinary metabolites of estrogen and progesterone have long been shown to accurately reflect, reflect serum levels. And that's something that Dutch themselves have published. And they have a like a cycle mapping test where you, where you measure these things every day. And obviously that's much more convenient than measuring it in the blood every day, which, which has been done in some studies. So that's potentially useful. However, the interpretation of that is tricky because when you look at individual variability 
in how these things change across, so say this is a, a menstruating woman who has a regular cycle, the, the variability from person to person is, is huge. So there was a, a, a classic study done by Schultz et al. like 20 years ago where they looked at laxity of the knee, lig- they were looking at laxity of knee, knee ligaments based on sex hormones and how they varied across the cycle. And then they sort of reanalyzed that and they took daily blood tests as well as daily examining the, the person. And what they saw was that what you expect, so if, if, you, if anybody's like learned some basic endocrinology and you know that like typical pattern of hormones across the month, right, across, across a menstrual cycle. So like in the, in the middle of the cycle, you have ovulation. Right before that, you have the estrogen peak that co- coincides with the LH peak, which is, a, which is around ov- ovulation. In healthy women with no issues whatsoever, like you, none of them have a pattern that looks like the typical pattern that you see that you're taught in a textbook. And often you'll have the estrogen peak that occurs after the LH peak, after ovulation, right? So the, the problem is that you, you measure these things and you say, hey, this doesn't look like how I expect it to be, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's problematic. So yes, the, if, if we go down my, my like list of things that are important, I think with a good test, like the Dutch test, the, and the test is valid and it's accurate. They've shown that. The problem is then how are you using that information? And so you need to be working with somebody who is very skilled and understands like the variability in these things and what they might mean to so say in the, in the setting of a fertil- like a fertility expert. So if all of that lines up, then I think that's useful. Dutch themselves, and there are, like I said, there are other companies that do this, have acknowledged that this, this is not the case for testosterone, particularly because testosterone can be affected by those who have the UGT1A1 mutation or Gilbert's, Gilbert syndrome. It affects phase two detoxification of testosterone and it doesn't end up in the urine in the same way. So if you want to monitor testosterone levels, serum testosterone is the way to do it. And then, so, so that's kind of the sex hormones, but we could talk about cortisol as well. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in. I just have a question. So what about, what about if you take the same person and you, and you measure their testosterone in the urine over time, would you, ex, would you expect the, the increase or decrease to be fairly consistent, uh, even if the, even if it's not a good predictor of the serum level? Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good question. I, it should, it should be. Yeah. So tracking trends in the same person assuming they don't have Gilbert syndrome. Yes, it, it should work. However, even if you look at the, if you look at the guidelines on the Dutch website, even they recommend serum monitoring for testosterone, say with if you're doing testosterone replacement therapy. Okay. So just to sum up Tommy's point, he's saying that when it comes to these urine hormone tests, they actually are analytically valid. Uh, they seem to be legit in that sense. But the interpretation is where the problems start coming. And by the way, some other tests, I would assume that you would just you you would think that the tests themselves are are more flawed. But let, let's go yeah. one at a time, and it will go. So that's the urine hormone test. the The test itself seems to be valid, but the interpretation is where the problem comes. And and for cortisol, is what would you say is the issue there or not issue? So similarly with cortisol, and this has been published by Dutch themselves. It correlates. So if you do a 24-hour urine collection versus their four-point daily dried urine cortisol, they match up quite nicely. You also can can demonstrate that you get the, the pattern across the different the four points. So I think they've shown that, you know, when they published this, i I'd you know, you could quibble about whether they they used best practices for like comparing to a gold standard. Like you don't see anything that you should have a, like they do linear correlations, which isn't great for comparing one test to another. They don't, you don't see bland Altman plots, that kind of stuff. But I, I believe that it's valid. It's measuring the right thing and you're getting the right results. And the interpretation. The pro- oh, okay, yeah. Sorry. So the, so this is, the, so <laughs> the, one of my favorite studies in this space was published by Dahlgren et al in 2009 in biological psychology. They took people, and they had them do a three-point cortisol, uh, salivary cortisol, which matches with urine, just it's delayed because it takes some time for it to end up in the urine. They did a three-point, so waking, then plus 15 minutes, which is like the cortisol awakening response. Some people do plus 30 minutes, but something like that. And then they did a, a bedtime. What they saw was that within each individual, within each time point, the coefficient of variable, so this is four weeks. So each person had 28 samples 
at each time point across four weeks. The coefficient of variation at, at different time points was like 25 to 50% in the morning to 100% at night. And when you look to the minimum and maximum across a month, sometimes like bedtime cortisol was 50 times higher one night compared to the night when it was at its lowest. The variation from day to day is so massive that it's almost completely impossible to interpret it on a, on a single point on a single day, which is what's done in these tests. So when they then aggregated and they accounted and they like statistically accounted for how each person's thing varied from day to day, then you can start to see trends. But nobody's measuring cortisol four times a day for a month to be able to figure out some of this stuff. And so my issue with cortisol is it's so variable. It's been shown very clearly how variable it is from day to day. But using one test on one day to tell you anything about your cortisol, I think is, is really problematic. Okay. And so that becomes just a, a cost problem because if you're going to do 28 tests in, in a month, right, you're going to be broke <laughs> by, yeah. by the end of that month. <laughs> it's just, I, okay. So the, the test itself, is, again, analyt seems analytically valid. No significant problems with the lab analysis of it. It's just that how you interpret those results that could change so drastically within the same person just from one is, day to the next is fraught with right is fraught with with a lot of danger and the only way that it could be really meaningful is if you really take a, a large number of tests on that same individual over time tommy if, if if you remember did they in that test did they ask the subjects to predict their their cortisol i don't think that, i don't think they did they did collect stuff around like stress and because I'm get, sleep issues. I'm, and what stuff. did that? What did that find? Because I'm going to guess that they might have predicted the direction correctly. <laughs> they probably could. <laughs> so, but but the, the interesting thing was that they couldn't find any trends in the data related to sleep and other oh, related factors to and, the stress and, until stress. they'd accounted for all these for the day to day variability, which was which was huge. Like if you they have this really nice, you, you don't get this very often anymore. But they have they have a table in the paper which has for each individual each time point the mean and the coefficient of variation and the minimum and maximum. So you can kind of see like in each individual person how, how hugely variable it is. It's fascinating. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, I, I mean, seems like a reasonable position. <laughs> I mean, what do you think, Chris? Like, uh, what would you say there? Well, I'm going to defer to to Tommy on this because the hormones are, are a little bit outside my expertise. I mean, I, I occasionally look at Dutch tests, but I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, claim that I have any expertise in them. I do. I mean, I think it's just broadly a problem that, you know, almost almost never do we have good capturing of the normal variation of things. Hmm. We could do another one of these on nutritional databases. I mean, God, this is so much worse <laughs> than than lab testing for blood. But but um, epidemiology, yeah. No, no. I mean, I mean, how much? I was just like, know, what's in Is it an apple? And uh, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> Well, actually, it's it's the vitamins that are real bad, but that's a, that's a different topic. No, but it's just generally, I think that's generally a problem. You just have to work around it. I mean, I don't know that, and I think this is part of the part of what you have to do is you have to, you know, have strong opinions lightly held. If you're trying to make a decision on a bunch of data, and you know that there's going to be, you know, that there's big caveats with the data, then you need to say like, well, we'll try this, but you know, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. And if the, whatever we tried based on that idea isn't working, it might be because this, you know, test was giving us bad information, you know, and I, I think you have to, you have to take into account how good or bad is the test when you're doing it. I mean, you try your best to collect good data in the first place, but that's often not available. And, and then you, you know, you have to recognize the limitations of the data and you have to collect better data if you're going to make a costly decision. You know, I guess I guess a great example would be there's so high dose biotin can interfere with a lot of lab assays, but strictly it's the very many dozens of different assays that are, use bi biotin related antibodies, and this does not include anything done with any type of chromatography, mass spec, or whatever else. And there are case reports of there was a case report of a girl who who had her uterus taken out as a teenager because she had a genetic defect that was consistent with the tumor that they thought she had based on her hormone levels. They just went in and operated. And, you know, it's, it's possible she wouldn't have been fertile anyway because of her genetic defect. 
but she's definitely not fertile now that they took her uterus out. Um, and it was totally spurious information because she had been on high dose biotin for some other reason. And, you know, they they figured it out when they decided to use mass spec for which is always an option. You know, you can you can go to the lab core and you can get sex hormones tested with an immunoassay or with mass spec. I don't know what I don't know why they offer both. I guess mass specs more expensive or whatever. But, you know, they, they could have just done that before they took her uterus out. But they did it after. <laughs> and, you know, so if you're making a decision like that, I think you have to be hyper conscious of the caveats in your data. Whereas if you're like, well, maybe you should take a multivitamin, you know, you probably don't need to, you know, run that you probably don't need to spend a whole lot of money figuring that out. And so you just have to be realistic about what's the, you know, what am I trying to do with this? And d d like, how important is it if I need to reverse course, if it's, if it's incredibly important to to have to reverse course, then you want very strong data. And so you don't want to make, you don't want to make a surgical decision based on someone's nighttime cortisol in the right. slot that they took at home. Right. <laughs> you know? I, let, let's move on to the organic acids. I think the urinary hormones is, I think there's, we, we understand that. I, I think there's the overall picture there is it could test, you know, quite a few things, but the interpretation is where it gets problematic because you really need to be doing a lot of these tests in order to get a good understanding, and that could be costly. And on the other hand, you could argue that if someone has tons of money, doesn't mind wasting money and, and looks at it in the right way, then it could be a reasonable test. You know, if they look at it very skeptically and they say, okay, I will use this as one data point out of 500 on, you know, based on all the data points that I have, then that could be a reasonable test. That's kind of how I understand it. and and. Quite a few things in genetics that are that way as well, right? There's no huge amounts of evidence for each variant in particular, but if you look at you know a bunch of information together, you could make certain decisions that that could be useful. But in any case, let's go to the organic acids, right? That's I think that's something that might encourage a little more you know, differences yeah, of opinion, or maybe right. perhaps. <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, maybe I would not. say. <laughs> First of all, I would say that there, I think we can find some disagreement here, but we'll see. Uh, if you go looking for I, it, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll just start off saying what I think. So, so first of all, urinary organic acids are generally more useful when they're paired with plasma amino acids. And a number of the tests that offer them do that. So, uh, for example, the Genova has two tests that are over highly overlapping and almost identical but slightly different because they bought one from another from another company the ion panel and the Nutrival, and those are those are both the Nutrival. you can get the amino acids in the urine or plasma plasma is generally more generally in most cases more, more reflective of the metabolic inferences that you want to make and there are there are some of these are some of these are very well validated markers of nutritional status so for example beta hydroxyisovalerate is a an amino acid metabolite that is, rises in a case of biotin deficiency and it's it's very well characterized there are many different studies with different populations done with depletion repletion studies and looking at the sensitivity and specificity for certain degrees of biotin depletion but you want to look at more than one marker because none of them have 100% sensitivity then you could go on down the line. There are other organic acids that are, for example, xanthorinate, kynorinate, and quinolinate are tryptophan metabolites that are pretty well validated as markers of vitamin B6 status. Methylmalonic acid is a well validated marker of B12 status. Tommy had mentioned before, form aminoglutamate is a well validated marker of folate status. All of these are urinary organic acids that are found on a urinary organic acid panel. Uh, so. The whole point of these tests in the first place was they were they were invented in the 60s and 70s to try to differentiate between different orders that produced congenital lactic acidosis, where you would have infants that were born into a metabolic crisis and inevitably would die soon after. I I think if you if you look at the, I would make a, make two points. So first of all, there is generally continuity between the genetic disorders in a metabolic pathway and the deficiencies of the nutrients used for the same enzymes. 
So for example, you can have an inborn methylonic acidemia, methylmalonic acidemia, which is a genetic defect in the enzyme that uses B12 to clear methylmalonic acid. But B12 deficiency causes elevation of methylmalonic acid in the same way. And on top of that, whereas it was formerly thought that inborn errors of metabolism are mostly onsetting in infancy, if you, I would, I would recommend that anyone who wants to dig into this, go to the 2022 edition of the Sadobre textbook, Inborn Metabolic Diseases. And they make the point that if you look at the difference between the 2016 and the 2022 edition, in 2016, they were saying, unfortunately, people who develop inborn errors of metabolism with, with onsets in adulthood are generally not diagnosed. In 2022, they say, there is, there is only recently some recognition in the medical community that people can have onsets of inborn errors of metabolism as adults. And so I think... But I would go further than they go and say that not only can onsets of inborn errors of metabolism be at any time during the lifespan, I would say that the evidence favors carrier status for inborn errors of metabolism having some impact on metabolism. Although it's true that if, that if you have carrier status for a disease and another healthy gene, there's various ways you can compensate to not have any manifestation of that disease. More, much more commonly than not, if someone has one, it, if someone has carrier status for a disease, they have 50% of the, of the metabolic effect of that. So if, if you, so for example, if you take, uh, just cause I know the numbers for bi for biotin stuff. So, cause I've been so in the weeds with it recently. If you take biotinidase deficiency, it has a diagnosis rate of one in 60,000 newborns. But if you look at carrier status, you have one in 123 people who are a carrier for it. And if you look at the biotinidase activity of a carrier, it's 50% of what their baby would be. So if you, have, if you have a baby born with biotinidase deficiency, their parents each have 50% of the baby's defect in recycling biotin. And what would you predict from that? You would predict that just as a baby born with this disease doesn't have an onset for a couple of years because... The problem is they can't recycle the biotin pool that they were born with. The person who has 50% of that problem is probably going to develop onsets in the year 40, fourth or fifth decade of life because it takes them longer to run out of their biotin. And there are case reports supporting that. So, for example, there's a case report of a woman who had biotinidase deficiency, who, whose child had biotinidase deficiency. And when after she had two pregnancies, when she was around 40 years old, she developed chronic vaginal yeast infection that, that would not respond to, to antifungals or it would respond, but it would just come back very rapidly. And so she called up the genetic counselor and said, you know, I know that my kid has to take 10 milligrams of biotin per day or he'll die. Is it possible that I need to take 10 milligrams of biotin today since he got his genes from me because I'm having these chronic yeast infections? And the genetic counselor said, I don't know, you could try it. And so she starts taking 10 milligrams of biotin per day, per day. Lo and behold, the, the vaginal yeast infections disappear. And so I think that, I think what I'm, I think what's, I think what you have various levels of poor recognition. And obviously I'm telling you a paradigm that, that is highly subject to controversy because, you know, I pulled one case report in support of what I said, but, but I, you know, I, I do believe that what you will find out if you look for it is that people's genetics operating in the background are going to have impacts on organic acids that do show patterns of, of evocative of the inborn errors of metabolism, and, they're, and they're, they're going to find improvements in their health if they fix them. So I think that's, that's not the main reason that these are useful, but I do think that it is a reason that they're useful. Okay, so let, let's go through some of the markers in particular, right? You mentioned a couple markers, but... Sure. I'm, I, I've got a, an older one here. And for example, let's say it says yeast and fungal markers. All right. And Tommy, let's, let's go through one at a time quick, rapidly. Tommy, yeast and, and fungal markers, yes or no? <laughs> I, so I guess the, 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 prob the problem is that I think there's going to be a, a, a gap between what you want right now, Joe, and what we can give you, which is why I think the, the framework I laid out is important right each per, like 
for you to say if you want to use these tests, is it valid? Like, is it repeatable? Is it like useful in this case? What's the best case scenario? If you have a hundred markers, Chris and I can't answer those questions for all of those. I guarantee we can't. So I think you have to take the framework and then apply it to those individually. I, I want to I want to push back a little bit on the repeatability. So I I think we are. I think Tommy and I are in total agreement on, on all the basic principles of of that stuff. But I would say that there is, you know, there are some markers that you only expect to go out of the range if someone is is in a metabolic crisis. And so, you know, it's it's repeatability isn't everything. Sometimes if someone is feeling like crap because they were stressing their body in a way that that stresses the metabolic pathway, they will have elevations during that time period. And on another day, they won't. So I think it's it's important to understand what are the causes of the variability and are they relevant? So it's 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 just really it's not really disagreement. It's yes, you need the repeatability when you know the things that that should cause variation are repeatable, but you also need to be conscious of the things that would cause variation because the variation might be a clue. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I'll agree with that. If there's, yeah, so no, no disagreement there. And, and I will, just to go back to what Chris was saying earlier, I think the first time we spoke, I, I made the case about most of the urine organic acid tests being tested for metabolic crises or developed for metabolic crises in infants, which is true. I will concede the point that it's very likely that there are, you know, sub, what we'll call subclinical because they don't present in that way, cases that then can develop symptoms in adulthood that would make perfect sense and i think chris has made a good case for that both now and then before when it was on your on your show however i do worry about this thought process that then which is the downstream effect of that and that's not what chris is saying but how people might interpret it which is that if you have x percent decrease in the function of some enzyme because of a, a snip that that's going to cut that's going to be associated with some deficit which is not how biology generally works he also said that you adapt around it and that's and we, we know that so if you look at we also know there's variability in the function of an enzyme for a given SNP. so mthfr that's very clearly shown there's a huge amount of variability like there's a there's a an average percent reduction in the function of the enzyme but there's a variability around that and then there's also a non-linear effect of that function relative to something like homocysteine levels or coding requirements right you can't just say x percent results in this x percent change here yeah but but the but the effect on the colon requirement is much more is much larger and much more consistent than the effect on homocysteine because one of the compensations is you use the choline in order to recycle the homocysteine you know so it's it's whenever you have a compensation you have some consequence of the compensation it's just but that's that, not necessarily a bad thing it's not necessarily right, it's a compensation a thing, this but is it, how this is how it, biology works well, yeah, but you can you can pick any compensation and, and it can have some negative effects. I mean, you can you can compensate for, you know, your acid base balance in your blood with in various ways. But it but depending on the context, the compensation might cause you some harm in the case of the MTHFR. I mean, it might cause you harm if your choline supply is very limited and it probably won't if, if it's not. And you might not yeah, even I mean, have that variation at all, depending on your riboflavin status and so yeah, on. Of course. Well, but yeah, I guess so. Like the point I, that... I, I agree with you. I'm okay. just, I think I'm just I think I'm just I'm emphasizing that the variation might be the compensation might be relevant. And you're okay. emphasizing that it doesn't have to be relevant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like okay. these, are both, these are both true. Yeah. But you don't want to let me mislead people into believing that it's always relevant. And <laughs> I don't want I don't want to let you mislead people into think it's never relevant. So. Yeah, we're, we're in heat. I think we're in heated agreement. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're yin yang. So. This is this is why I haven't even tried to go down the rabbit hole yeah. because you know if someone's got elevated yeast and fungal markers that doesn't mean that, that let's say it does mean that they have yeast overgrowth that doesn't tell you anything about why they have yeast overgrowth and so to me it's it. yeah or to do about right and so to me it's it's I'm just I'm just a skeptic in general of of most of what's known about what to do about the microbiome I'm not saying that I'm not saying there's nothing that's known I'm just I just I'm I'm just very I'm very I'm skeptical of the microbiome centric sort of the microbiome is driving health. I think quite often the microbiome is driven by the rest of the systemic health. Yeah, right. Agreed. I, I actually I also think in some way that the best way to see if somebody how somebody sometimes I don't you know, I mean, just 
how somebody immune system fights against yeast infections is actually look at their nails and skin, right? If you have an overgrowth, like there's tinea versicolor, which is a very common skin yeast infection. And then a lot of people have fungus infections on their their nails or they have jock itch or they have all kind like, you know, athlete's foot. Those are all fungal infections. If you have a fungal infection, it means you, you might have a fungal infection elsewhere in the body or whatever, right? Like your body is obviously not very good at fighting fungal infections. That's a very uneducated way to think about it. <laughs> I don't know. If no, I think that's I think that's extremely true. And and certainly, if they have all of those things, then it's obviously a systemic problem with the immune function. And I know, used to I'm have more, uh, more interested in figuring yeah. out what's at the root of the you know why is the immune function limited is yeah. is how I look exactly at it. without taking any of these tests. I I used to have a skin fungus tinea versicolor. Ten percent of the population has it. It's just even more it depends where you are, or whatever it depends on the climate. But essentially, it's like a very common skin fungus where it's it, it's sunspots essentially. You know, you, you get these patches on on your skin, and I took antifungals. It went away, came back every time. Went away, came back. It was like, you know, and I just thought at one point, like, there's got to be something wrong with my system that it can't fight against these infections. And then one day I started taking niacin and it just went away. And and I also started taking biotin, by the way. So I'm not 100% sure which one it was from, but it just went away without antifungals and it hasn't come back. So, yeah. And, and so I, I don't think like, let's just for me, I, I think, you know, without those nutrients, I wasn't fighting these fungal infections very well. And I think as you get older, right, like a lot of times people are more likely to develop these, I, I see like fungal infections on their nails, toenails or whatnot. And, you know, that, that's one of, that, that's that's probably going to be more accurate than any test you're going to take in, in terms of how your body is doing with yeast and fungal infections. But anyway. That's true, yeah. but some testing might help you figure out why. Right, but not, but what, 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 is important that you guys are saying is yeah, but not uh, but the maybe <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's some potential that these te- like theoretically, possibly some of them might you know tell you one thing or another, but n- these aren't actually telling you what you would do about it anyway if they even are relevant, which is not 100 percent clear, right? Okay, so and that's similar for the bacterial markers as well. Um, you know, I see there's Clostridia bacterial markers as well. One thing that was interesting is I, I was just recently reading about Clostridia sporogenic, sporogenes, sporogenes, uh, whatever. Are you are you uh, looking how, at a Great Plains test? Yeah. Must be. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. I just pulled up a random one from um, right. some time ago. Sorry. Yeah. I'm um, following along with you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so no, but I, 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 I'm. In terms of that one, I actually was reading about it in order to induce oral tolerance to foods. So it turns out that you know, when you, you consume tryptophan, you, you produce kynurin, you produce these indoles, and you, you, one of these indoles that you produce is called IPA, which helps you tolerate, it, it helps build immune tolerance to a whole bunch of different things in the gut, and it's just very healthy in a whole bunch of different ways. One of the things that does that is C. sporogenes, spor, sporogen, whatever. <laughs> in any case, I just see it here. I'm wondering if, you know, and, and, and one of the things, I actually wanted to test if I have it because a lot of people do not have that here apparently. And I, it's, it shows it here. I, I just don't, I wouldn't know if this actually can tell you if you have it or not. What do you think, Chris? When I get this test, I immediately skip to page three. <laughs> Okay. All right. So this is I don't even one, have of, to one ask of my questions. One of my questions for Chris was not which markers do you think are useful? Because if anybody's gonna have evidence for using these markers in context, I believe Chris is the, it's the one is which ones do you not look at? Let's go through the ones that are relevant. So methylmalonic acid you mentioned is relevant. Yeah, right? we all uh, I think all of us are acid. agreed that this is a good B twelve marker. Yeah. Okay. And and that a B twelve marker in the urine, you're saying, because this is a urine test. I mean, my, and maybe actually Tommy might be better able to address the research than me on this, but I, I actually would prefer to see it in blood and urine because then you could, you know, then you could sort of like know that it's just generally elevated versus maybe you have a false negative if it, or positive or whatever, if someone's kidneys are not functioning right. But, yeah, um, but so I, I would prefer to see both, but. I, I actually used it. We, one of, one of the most enlightened thing I remember about 
like working in a standard hospital setting back in the UK, like 10 years ago now, was that whenever we were concerned about B12 status, it automatically came with a methylmalonic acid measurement, which in, uh, blood, in, yeah. in, in, in blood. And so, yeah, because I think there's, uh, I think kidney function can, can change how much ends up in the urine. I think blood is better, but I don't think urine is bad, you know, assuming that the kidney function but, but look if if someone has if someone has this flagged and they weren't looking for it that might be the impetus to yeah. mm-hmm. to test the other markers you know yeah okay and so vitamin b6 pyridoxic is that good chris relevant well the way that they depict it here is that you just want it to be under their the top limit of their range and so i don't know what you would do with that you but if it's if it's low i that is a sign of b6 deficiency i don't think it's as good as the tryptophan metabolites but i like i was saying before i do think it's better to look at more than one marker rather than one what about do, serum b6 some validation. Let's say. is that what's better serum b6 or this i think i think serum b6 is not that useful but i'm kind of against looking at functional markers without testing serum levels because you know if your functional markers are off you would at least want to know whether you're absorbing the b6 or not so it would be highly relevant if your B6 was was low or high, but but it's, I mean, apart from apart from the issue of recent intake, the I think the main problem with plasma B6 is that it, a it's not that sensitive to nutritional status, but also it can go up or down based on just cellular uptake, and and so I think you can get a misimpression if you're just looking at plasma B6. Okay, just my n equals one. The more B6 I took the more my plasma levels went up. So it would be shocking to me if that were not true. (laughs) But (laughs) Right. I'm just saying that there is some impact in how much you're getting and how much what's in your blood. Uh, But if you're supplementing, first of all, you can't get a B6 supplement that's anywhere near as low as what you got from food. So if this thing doesn't skyrocket your plasma B6, there's something wrong with you, which is fine. There's something wrong with everyone, but I'm just saying there's something very (laughs) specifically wrong with your B6 absorption wrong with you but the question is so there is some controversy over the interpretation of the markers because as an example you know birth control will upregulate your xanthronic and kynorenic in your urine is that because is that is it because it made you be six deficient or is it because you're just sending more tryptophan into the kynorenic pathway in response to the estrogen I would say, are those two different things? I mean, these, these, first of all, one of the end products there, quinoline, is neurotoxic. So there's, you definitely don't want that elevated and in your, well, in your, in your nervous system anyway. And I, I think if you have a systemic B6 deficiency and it's raising those markers in the urine, I think, it, I think you can infer that it is raising them in the brain. You can't test that and you're not going to do a spinal tap on CSF xanthorenate in regards to it. But, you know, if B, if there if there's a B six responsive relationship to the urinary markers, it's because there's a systemic B six issue, and so yeah, some tissues might hold on to B six better than others, but at some way down the path on B six deficiency, all your tissues are going to be deficient. So I think I think there is some value in minimizing at least the quinolinate, if not the other markers themselves. But I also think it's just it's sort of it's what it is is your you're raising your need for that pathway by by using more of it, and you are probably taking B6 out of other pathways. So not everyone will agree, but I would say that whenever those markers are elevated, that's a, that's a good sign of B6 deficiency, So, I, or at least functional B6 deficiency. And so I would say, you know, you got your B6 through the roof, you know, but did that normalize your, your functional markers? I think that's, that's why you want to see both. You want to see, like, is the vitamin there and is it doing its job? Because the vitamin's got to get there, it's got to get into the cells, and it's got to do something. And so I mm-hmm. think it's it's the best way to look at it is to look at the functional markers. Is it doing its job? The plasma level is it is it getting absorbed? And the intracellular level is it or whole blood level or whatever, depending on the, the what it is when you can, which tells you if it's getting into the cells because that's going to tell you kind of the the three step process of whether it's going where it's supposed to go and doing what it's supposed to do. Right. Okay. And and just something that I do, by the way, I don't know what you think about this, but like what I look at my genetic predisposition also for each of these nutrients and some so for some of them, the predispositions are better than others. 
But for example, you know, like certain nutrients like zinc is pretty good. You know, flag that I was had a higher need for zinc and I've always had a, a much higher need for zinc than like my serum zinc is always low if I don't supplement with it. So that's also another way to try to, it, it gives you an idea of at least what tests that you might need to take in order to like, it, there's, it's a broad idea. You could look at many things and see like, okay, this I likely need more of. Then you could do take the test and see if you actually need more of it. All um, right. Interesting. I'd, I'd like to ask Chris's thought on this thought process, which is that, so say, right, Joe, you developed a polygenic risk score to predict serum zinc, right? If that's what like, they had the whole bunch of people, they did their, they did their genetic tests, right? So you have all their SNPs and then you measured their zinc. So we do yeah, have a polygenic if you're, if you're, risk score. If your polygenic it, yeah, risk but, yeah. score predicts that you have lower circulating zinc, right? That's likely to be the case, right? Statistically. And so that's Correct. a self-fulfilling prophecy. Does that mean that that, lo that lower zinc is actually biologically relevant? Or does your body function just fine with a slightly lower circulating zinc? Well, well I look, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd love to see validation studies of it. My, my suspicion would be that the biological relevance, my, my suspicion would be that the, it would, the polygenic risk score would have a component that may reduce your need for zinc and a component that may make you more vulnerable to zinc deficiency and that you would have to fish out that heterogeneity. And I'd love to see studies validating it as well as validating like different ways of calculating it on that basis. But I don't, I don't, what is well validated is that when your plasma zinc gets down to 70 or 75, you're at the edge of developing clinical symptoms. And if it gets down below 50, you're, you have big problems. And if it gets lower than that, you have severe problems. And I don't know that I would, I don't, I don't know that I would modify those numbers with a polygenic risk score unless you could kind of test, like repeat the depletion, repletion studies but stratify people by their polygenic risk score. But if you did that, you would want to look at the polygenic risk score, not for, and I don't know the components of, of yours, Joe, so, so let me know if, if you've addressed this already, but you would want to separate it into polygenic risk score for, not for a lower, not for things that predict a lower plasma zinc, but things that predict uh, aspects of that that would increase your need for it, with some of which would be a higher plasma zinc. So like, if you have a defective zinc trans zinc transporters, there are a bunch of them, and they're gonna which ones they are it will depend di will dictate uptake into different tissues. Some of those might decrease your plasma zinc if they if it's like better transport from blood into certain tissues that where where you would be most likely to develop a clinical symptom. But others might increase your need, especially especially if you're just not absorbing it from the intestines. So if you can sort of mechanistically ferret out the cluster that you think would genuinely make you more likely to be deficient, then I would love to see a, re a repeat of those. This will never happen, but I would love to see the, a repeat of those depletion repletion studies from the 80s stratified by, by the sort of need for plasma zinc score to see if the clinical symptom, and I guess there's a way you could crowdsource that in a less experimental way or a less controlled way as well. That would also be interesting. If, like, if you had a bunch of people testing their plasma zinc and and reporting whether how often they get sore throats you know it'd be very interesting if you had like gene genes that could predict a different level of plasma zinc that predicted a sore throat so i actually feel like most people have too much information and i'm generally trying to whittle down the information to small bits that we could put more weight on and i actually think that's where the best utility from this, from this stuff would come from so like a, a lot of the a lot of the risk stuff is sort of like you know, where am I in the middle of some spectrum? Am I on like 10% to the left or 10% to the right of the middle? I think that's, that stuff is sort of like, there's a huge amount of that stuff that would have very little utility in my framework. Whereas if there's something that can help me understand something anomalous about what I would have done anyway, right? Like, so the, the interesting things about genetics to me is why am I doing one thing that sh by all metrics should do x and it's doing c it's not even doing y it's doing c on the, the total opposite of this of the spectrum right and so and so i think that's i think that's a smaller amount of the information but i think that's where the real golden nuggets are 
because I would have tested my plasma zinc anyway. And if it was 70, I would have taken zinc anyway, you know, but if I have, but if I find something in this that could explain why my behavior is anomalous to what I would have expected, then I think that's sort of like the golden nugget that I would hone in on. And I, I know that I don't remember what they are, but I know you do that you do personally have some of those because we've talked about them the last time that I was on with tryptophan handling and stuff like that. So, and that was also what caught my attention when we were talking was just about these anomalous things where I'm like, yo, that's not normal. Like you have, you must have something wrong with, with your tryptophan handling because it's not normal to need that much of this thing to make this thing happen. And I think, I think that's me. I would want to say, okay, I have these 350 reports. Where can I find the one, two or three things that are really weird about me that are going to, that are going to be the, you know, the things that, because I think if you can find the one, two or three things that are just way off the charts, abnormal, then that's where you can get like really move the needle. Curious Classic. what you think, Chris, and just in terms of, it, it seems like you like overall the nutritional markers, as I understand. Okay, so methylmalonic acid, like it. Pyridoxic acid, like it, but not the way they use it. Pentathenic acid, like it, but double the bottom of the range. Glutaric acid, kind of a joke, but can be useful. Ascorbic acid, you should measure it in plasma, not in urine. COQ10. Meth methyl citric acid is a terrible marker of biotin status. <laughs> and uh, and NAC, NAC, man, NAC is so confusing, right? This thing says glutathione precursor and chelating agent. And people, people come to me and they're like, why is my NAC zero? And it's like, because you're not taking NAC. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, you think that's garbage? No, I, no, I think looking at urinary NAC might have some utility in someone who's being treated for something with high dose NAC and you're trying to infer something okay, about something like it's that's not that's not you're how not supposed used, to have knack so. in your urine if you're not taking Ima it. imagine like paracetamol <laughs> overdose or acetaminophen overdose which you're treating with knack that's how they treat it right and right you're trying to titrate it to need and if you're giving a right. bunch but none's ending up in the urine right then you yeah. maybe need more i believe that but yeah, yeah. right yeah one out of the way that one person has used the test in the past um, just so just running through backwards on this, I think looking at the peroxisomal versus markers versus the mitochondrial markers for fatty acid metabolism can give you some inference into whether someone is putting more burden on their mitochondria to metabolize fat than the mitochondria can handle. And that sometimes might mean someone is on too high fat of a diet based on their own metabolism, or it might mean that someone has you know, needs to supplement with carnitine or something like that. I think that the ketones are mainly interesting. I mean, it's sort of obvious that someone on a ketogenic diet would have high ketones and, and not if not. I think if it's an anomaly where someone's eating a high carb diet and has ketones to the roof, I think that's very interesting as underlying disorder. And I think that the ketone ratio, which they don't give a ratio of on this test, can be very useful for looking at different types of mitochondrial disorders and, and kind of broadly categorizing them into ones that affect the respiratory chain versus ones that affect the citric acid cycle. I think the kynorinate and quinolinate are good B6 markers. I think that some of this stuff is highly relevant to sort of... Which is just to point out, that's not how they're used on the test that we're looking at right now. <laughs> oh, I don't... I don't. Yeah. I, like I said, I skipped to page three. <laughs> the, I think the citric acid cycle markers are very rarely saying anything, but sometimes when someone's got a specific problem that very much lines up with one of them being through the roof. I think sometimes that that tells you something about what's what's going on. But I would the citric I acid ones are the I, mitochondrial markers. You're saying mitochondrial markers, Krebs cycle metabolites. Like mm -hmm. I would not, right. I wouldn't be there trying to to take ratios out of everyone's stuff. But sometimes you sometimes you get something that looks really really strange, and it matches up with other markers on there that all point in the same direction. I think that's that's they would always be a sort of very secondary tertiary thing I would look at. Lactate and pyruvate are similarly very useful for mitochondrial disorders of certain types, along with the ketone ratio, or actually more metabolic disorders outside the mitochondria. I, I kind of, I kind of look at oxalate, but I don't, I don't go deep diving into the different metabolites in that. And that pretty much covers everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything um, on the great pains test, anyway. Is I mean the oxalates. I I mean is that 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 might tell you your risk for kidney stones, right? 
I think if you have high urinary oxalates, you would probably have a higher risk of kidney stones. Yeah. Right. What do you think about that, Tommy? Yeah, that's probably true. I mean, most, the majority <laughs> of kidney stones are oxalate. Kidney. That's not how they're looking at it, probably. Though. <laughs> well, no, I, th- I, think, I think oxalate is a metabolic toxin. I think it's, I think it's clearly demonstrated to be a metabolic toxin. So the, there's a lot, there's, it's sort of open-ended about what do you do about that. But, but I think that, I don't think you want high oxalate, even if you don't have a kidney stone. Okay. I mean, there are ways to bring down oxalates in the body, right? I mean... Some of them work in some of the people. Right. And some of them don't work okay. in... So, and, and the neurotransmitter ones, you think, any of them you think are legitimate? I'm not, I'm not too bullish on the neurotransmitter metabolites, but okay. I, think, I think you could sort of like vaguely make some inferences about... So, what I, what I wouldn't try to do is, is like try to say how much dopamine is in the brain based on how much dope pack is here. Um, you know, but, but if the, if the norepinephrine epinephrine ratio is altered or the dopamine to norepinephrine ratio metabolites are altered, that might prompt me to look at some other things in methylation, iron, copper, or vitamin C that might influence those conversions. And so I wouldn't like diagnose something on it, but it might be a clue that might make me look somewhere else. Okay. I would say um, that's the best case scenario. You have somebody like Chris, <laughs> some, some, somebody like Chris who can read the tea leaves and come up with something useful. <laughs> I'd say the, the, the only useful things here are, like we said, the quinolate and kynurinate, but for something else, not for what they're being used for. No, right. I think those, I think kynurinate is a good marker of B six deficiency. Yeah, no, but that's not what it's, it's being used as. Oh, what is it used for there? It's being like trying to tell you something about tonin. The, no, like the. They they talk about the ratio. Do they, maybe they, I think they used to provide a ratio, but like kynurinin versus they and you know. Oh, it's in the neurotransmitter. Like it's in the yeah, neurotransmitter. It's in, it's in the neurotransmitter I forgot yeah. to say I also don't read any of the headers. <laughs> 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 I never read the section headers because they they drive me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I don't read any of the the text. Right. So yeah, I agree. Okay. On, on, I agree on on B six, but not for what they use it. Not for, oh. to tell you about neuro, okay. neurotoxicity and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Let's quickly go through the IgG food tolerance test. I already know your opinion, Tommy. <laughs> Basically, I, they're complete I, I, bunk. I, I, I listened. I listened to what Tommy said, and I didn't disagree with any of it. In okay. The, in the so, interview that he did last with you. Yep. Okay. So so overall, so, so, it's bunk. so like if we talk about the list of things that I mentioned that you should check. Is the test valid? No, it's not. You don't need to worry about any of the other subsequent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't. Yeah. All right. That's good to, that's good that, that it is, we got that out of the way. Stool test. Oh, well, if we're going to, if we're going to bash this serum IgG, we have to bash the stool IgA. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's do it what's happening the 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 stool iga not good the, i've seen well, studies it's, it's, on, on stool iga that that it it uh, I, there's something to it i don't know i maybe maybe not i don't know you tell me i saw i saw a study that this guy i think his name was kenneth fine did like 10 or 20 years ago where he was looking at the utility of the anti-gliadin wheat the anti-wheat mm-hmm. sort of celiac related iga in the stool and its utility for looking at gluten sensitivity and what he found was that 90% of people who went on a gluten-free diet improved their health in, in both groups of low IGA and high IGA. And I was like, dude, you got this posted on your website and it shows that the test doesn't do anything. And you might have some selection bias with the 90%. But Wait, so it's, is that well, so, is so IG, Tommy complete I, bunk as well, you think? So as it's used, yes. It's, it's okay. been... There, I think I remember seeing one study where it was looked at to look at like remission in celiac disease with a gluten-free diet or something like that. But then it's used by people to say, oh, this person has gluten intolerance, which is so which is very different and like then goes. Oh yeah, I don't I don't think of it as I actually didn't realize it was used for diagnosing gluten intolerance until you oh, yeah, people do talked that about time. that. <laughs> So I was my, just reading about it in the research that said secretar, secretory IGA helps improve tolerance to foods. Oh, I no, I agree with that. What I'm 
I'm sorry. I, I, I no, 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 I mean, I, 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 I think no, we were coming at, I didn't even know. How no, we were, we're, we're talking about two different things. So I should clarify. So, so yeah. I think that low secretary IGA in the stool probably is indicative of a problem of having generally low IGA. But, but what I, what I was specifically talking about was specific anti food antibodies that are IGA and saying you have an intolerance to X because you have an anti X IGA antibody in the stool, I think that's total nonsense because number one, the the distinguishing characteristic of IgA antibodies is that they're not inflammatory and they are the they are sort of anti-inflammatory in a sense because they can but they can bind and mop up things without without initiating an inflammatory response to those things. But also the IgA in the gut is particularly polyreactive. And I I'm you know I deeply question that an anti like if you find an anti egg antibody, it's probably an anti wheat antibody as well, because they're so lacking in specificity in the gut. That's right. that's my problem with those. But I'm not against. I mean, I'm not against school stool tests in general. Well, what what do, what do you think is the value of stool tests in your opinion? Well, it this is outside my expertise, and so I don't I don't I don't want I can't don't trust what I'm saying as much as what I said before about everything else. But but I I think that there is, I think if you've got high, well no I do feel pretty confident that if you've got fatty stool you have a fat malabsorption or fat digestion or you know something like that problem, and then but I, the microbiome stuff I'm I think is, I would I would interview Lucy Mailing about. Oh, the I was going to say stuff. exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah, you should talk talk to Lucy. She she knows the she knows yeah. the answer. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And what, but what do you think, Tommy, of that overall? I mean, is there anything, what do you think is like, is, is, is there any val validity to it? Yeah. So I think there's, there's definitely utility identifying pathogens if they align with, with symptoms mm -hmm. beyond that sort of, you know, it, it depends on the stool test, you know, are you doing shotgun sequencing versus 16 S are you, can are you, are you getting down to the strain level Are you having some idea of functions and how, you know, like, functions of the microbes relative to symptomatology that kind of stuff and you need an expert to really navigate that and so lucy so lucy's would, would be a great person to speak to. lucy okay so we got the stool out of the way is let's see we, we last one okay so you were saying the ion amino acids panel chris yeah okay. um i mean serum amino acids i actually wanted to get a test for those i think i mean i think those could be useful in certain ways maybe i'm wrong i mean what do you think? I think generally you are looking more at a pattern than you are at specific markers being off. And in some cases, I would use, in some cases, you have patterns that are pretty well validated. In other cases, I think there are uses that are more speculative, but are nevertheless useful. So as an example, when I was having a twitching problem in 2017, which was post uh, some apparent mitochondrial damage from antifungal that I was on, my one abnormality on the ion panel was a very high glutamate to glutamine ratio. And so I just went through like, what, what are all the different reasons that you could have more glutamate and less glutamine that might correlate with the, my history and also my symptoms? And the one thing that I came up with was low pH in increasing the renal hydrolysis of glutamine to glutamate. And so I measured my urine pH and lo and behold, it was wildly acidic. And, and it was getting extremely acidic in response to exercise. And so as a short-term band-aid, I started supplementing with bicarbonate. And I found that if I got my urine pH up into the sixes, that I felt like insanely better. It was like the difference between being laid out. Like I would do a workout and I'd get laid out for like five days and I, and I could uh, bicarbonate was like titrated up to get my urine pH was able to resurrect me out of the bed. You, so there are things, there are things like that where like, I don't know of any studies validating the utility of that in that manner, but, but I think that, you know, recognizing the biochemistry, you can, you can use it in a useful way. Some of these are good markers in conjunction with the with the organic acids. So, for example, if someone's branched chain amino acids are elevated and their organic acids are 
are el that are elevated in a pattern consistent with impaired branch chain amino acid metabolism, I think it makes a stronger case together. Of course, you have to consider how much protein someone's eating and the potential influence on these things. So, you know, there are there are things that you can put together in that way. Some of these amino acids being off are consistent with certain vitamin deficiencies, but they're not really specific markers. Like I was saying before, if you've got an elevation of lactate and alanine, and I'm I'm blanking the other one off the top of my head, that you know that pattern is is evocative of thiamine deficiency. Oh, al actually I have it right here in front of me. Alanine, lactate, pyruvate, and alpha ketoglutarate together are generally evocative of thiamine deficiency. But there's not really many examples where a specific amino acid being off on its own is a specific marker of anything. And then on top of that, I think it's a very terrible idea to try to like treat your um, low amino acid levels with, with amino acids. Like, well, there's a lot of people are like, oh, my alanine is low. Like which, which proteins alanine. have more alanine and, and stuff like that. I, I think that's a little way out of where, what you want to do with it. I, I think what I'm taking away from this is, you know, if you're going to buy these tests, the only way I would recommend them is if Tommy and Chris read them over. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was definitely, for most of it, I punt, punt it over to Chris. But I think that's, like, I was, l let's be honest, I was pretty bullish the last time I was on your show. And the reason why is because the case, like, you're hearing a true expert talk about these things. And it's all about pattern recognition, multiple things, indicating other things. You look somewhere else, right? It gives you an overall nobody is using it like this as far as i know unless even chris's cheat unless sheet they're probably studying, isn't enough uh, right unless chris they've read all the brain. textbooks right yeah so <laughs> so the typical use case that is, is what so... i try I, I tried to i tried to help other people do this with the cheat sheet that's that was my point <laughs> yeah no and, and the, 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 don't get me wrong the, the cheat sheet is is great I, I paid for it the minute it came out however long ago but the my point is the typical use case is so far from this that that's what really concerns me. Okay. That I mean this this podcast was quite useful at least for me even you know I might, you know, I, never, I don't know how many people tuned out but you know what well, I mean cuz on the one hand I heard this you know there's a lot of bs there and then the, on the other hand I heard there's some good things. What I came away with is unless it's it's really like the the only good things in there are not the way that people are typically using it as a general rule, maybe there's, you know, they're using one marker in the way that, it, you know, that there's good use for it, but it seems like it's extremely complex. And uh, it seems like you, you, you have to, if somebody's going to look at these things, they really, really have to know what they're doing and, and, and be able to filter out the noise from the nuggets. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and like Tommy said, most, the way that the, the, I think the way that the, the people who are teaching the practitioners generally, like you have these, the teachers who are telling you how to do these things, just in the genetic space, I see how much BS there is. And I think people just need to understand that, that they need to be very careful in, in how to interpret these tests. And if, if they don't know how to interpret these tests, again, like Tommy said, even if somebody does know how to interpret these tests, it's going to be quite a lot of money and quite a lot of time actually to to really go down this rabbit hole and so is that worth although it? if yeah I, I would say that if you need it it's worth it right if right you if you've got time, serious problems and you yeah. you couldn't figure it out in any other way then you know it could be useful right well i think yeah. i think as as a general rule i think it's good to hit the low-hanging fruit and then you know see where you wind up and if you still are hungry to get better then you know look some people need to go deep in the weeds because they're trying to go from 0 0.99 to 0 0.999 in athletic performance and other people can't you know might be going deep in the weeds because they can't get out of bed in the morning and then there's everyone in in between so i think you know if if you do the obvious things and the simple things and you're happy with your life and you want to go move on to other things and you should just move on to other things but there will be a variety of different people who will need to go deeper but why they need to go deeper will be different for for different people and some of us just like to geek out okay awesome i really appreciate the wisdom the insights 
the tea leaf reading. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no. But yeah, I mean, you guys are obviously very, very knowledgeable in this space and appreciate you got you coming on and really explaining what's what. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Thanks. All right. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping keep us ad-free. 